everyone, and welcome to this NEA Big Read Waukesha Reads presentation on preserving your family's history um, with oral history stories. If you have questions during the program tonight, go ahead and type them into the YouTube chat box. We will be compiling them to be answered at the end of the presentation. And our presenter tonight is one of Waukesha Public Library's adult reference librarians who has a special interest in oral history. Everybody, please welcome Erin Dix. All right, hello. Thank you, Corey. Um, and welcome everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to this program. I'm happy to be here to talk with you about preserving your family stories with oral history. Um, I wanna share just a little bit of my background before we get into the presentation. Um, so I have my master's degree from UW-Madison from the library school there. And while I was there, I worked for about a year with the oral history program at the UW archives, which is a really great resource for really the whole state. Um, and after that time, I was an archivist at Lawrence University up in Appleton for nine years. And so in both of those roles, I had the opportunity to work with a lot of recorded interviews as part of oral history collections um, and to conduct interviews myself. So that's sort of where I'm coming from in terms of my experience. Um, but for full disclosure, I have not recorded interviews with my own family members. Um, putting this presentation together reminded me that I really should think about doing that. Um, so I hope that some of you are inspired similarly. Um, there are a lot of excellent resources out there for learning more about doing family oral history. Um, and so this presentation, to, to put this together, I compiled a lot of information from those resources. And there's a couple places, I'm gonna pull up a slideshow in a second here that we'll go through. And you'll notice a couple of slides where I've pulled together some specific resources. Um, so I would really encourage you to check those out, to do some of your own research, um, if you're interested in learning more beyond what we talk about uh, this evening. Okay, so now I'm gonna try to share my screen and we'll see if we can get this going. Okay, are we good with this? Okay, awesome. So I'm gonna start this. Okay. So um, this is a quick outline of what we're gonna what we're gonna talk about. So um, we'll talk about what oral history is, how to prepare for an interview, how to conduct the interview, how to share and preserve that recording, and then we'll wrap up. Um, with some final thoughts and I can try and address any questions that you might have typed into that chat box. Um, just sort of for your planning, this presentation takes about 30 to 40 minutes, so not too long. Um, and really the overall goal here is to provide you with the information that you would need to plan and record an oral history interview with a family member or friend. Um, I'm assuming we have an audience of mostly adults, but you can absolutely involve kids in these experiences and that can be really powerful and fun for everyone. Um, and I would say you could even use some of the information about doing an interview uh, just for having conversations uh, with your family about your history without that pressure of recording. So I think there are a number of things that you could take away from this, I hope. Okay, so what is oral history? What, what are we talking about? Um, oh, one of these didn't work, that's okay. Um, the term oral history is used pretty loosely these days. Uh, so these are some examples of things. Uh, hopefully you can see we've got an oral history of Center Stage, which is a truly excellent dance movie from the year 2000. Um, I think the image down on the bottom left was an oral history of David Pumpkins. I'm sad that you can't see that. David Pumpkins is in Saturday Night Live sketch. Anyway, then on the right we have uh, World War Z, an oral history of the zombie war. Um, I have read and loved all of these things, um, but I would say they wouldn't quite meet the definition of oral history that a historian would use. 
So this is the definition of oral history that comes from the Oral History Association. It's a field of study and a method for gathering, preserving, and interpreting the voices and memories of people, communities, and participants in past events. So when historians talk about oral history, they are talking about recorded interviews with people that collect and preserve their memories and personal commentaries. Um, there are professional oral historians. It is a formal discipline as oral history association would imply. Broadly speaking, the, the oral tradition as a way of sharing stories and preserving information predates the written word. But more narrowly, um, oral history, at least in the United States, um, it really um, started gaining popularity in the mid 20th century when there was sort of a, um, you had at the same time technological advances that meant that it was easy to go out into the field to record interviews with people. And there was this shift uh, in the historical uh, sort of academic discipline from uh, a traditional history that really focused on the stories of um, great men, right? Um, presidents, leaders, celebrities, elites, you know, upper classes. Um, in the 1960s, that focus shifted away to a focus on social history or the history of ordinary people. And oral history really provides a way to fill the gaps in written history. Um, to preserve the stories of people that you might not find in paper records. Many of the professionals who do oral history are associated with libraries or archives or museums or other institutions um, that have collections of oral history interviews. And many of those collections are accessible to the public for their own research use. And even a lot of those are available online. So I have several examples that I want to share. Um, the first is an organization called Densho, and there's a description of it there on the right. Um, Densho is um, devoted to preserving the stories of Japanese Americans who were incarcerated during World War II. Um, so very relevant to our um, big reads this year. Um, and they have just this fantastic online repository of all of these oral history interviews. And I have a quick excerpt um, from one that I want to share. This was an interview with Sue Kunitomi, who uh, was incarcerated at Mansonar, and uh, she talks here briefly about leaving Mansonar. So I'm going to try and play this for you all. Tell me the uh, circumstances of your leaving camp. I decided. Uh after the December 7th riot that I did not want to spend another Christmas in Manzanar. And so I filed an application to, for what they call application for leave, which was the original uh, title of the loyalty oath. And uh, I got an offer from the YWCA in Madison, Wisconsin for a month of uh, board and room and they would help me find a job. I had several friends who had gone to work at the Madison General Hospital and a, a Catholic hospital. They were nurses and they were writing to me to tell me to come out and things are very much, much better back east. And so uh, when the offer came from the YWCA, I decided to take it and go and try to get into the University of uh, Wisconsin, because I wanted to go back to school. And uh, so that's how I got to leave camp. Okay, so that's a great example of a, a pretty brief excerpt from a video oral history interview that again, is from Densho. Um, more locally, there are some really great oral history collections available at the Wisconsin Historical Society. The one on the left there uh, describes the Somos Latinas project, um, which was a collection of oral history interviews that interviewed um, Latina activists in Wisconsin a few years ago. 
So those are available online. And then on the right, there's an example of a project from UW Milwaukee about, um, they had an HIV AIDS oral history project. Um, so these are, these are things that you could check out. Um, UW Milwaukee, I think also has some really great civil rights focused um, collections of oral histories. So really there's, there's just a lot out there to see. And I have one more example before we get into the sort of how to portion here. Um, this is uh, an interview from my previous job. Um, when I was at Lawrence University, we had a lot of interviews with alumni. And this is an example, just a really quick excerpt that I used to play for college students when I was telling them about oral history and describing how it can um, tell stories that you wouldn't find in written records. So we'll see if I can get this to play for you. And so, and we used to walk, they, they're talking now about the river walk. Right. There right. used to be a little path that you walked and they called it going, going down river. Oh, over and, to the Yeah, Alexander. and there was a cemetery down, oh, okay. down, and it's where we all went to do a little smooching. Yeah, at the cemetery. In the, in the cemetery. <laughs> Well, it was kind of quiet. You could sit at the foot of a, you know, of a, and, and that was what, if you said we're going down river, everybody knew what you meant, where you were headed. <laughs> and, <laughs> and except that there was a screech owl down there that got very eerie, spooky sounds if you were sitting in, late at night in the oh, cemetery. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, I just really love that. I love that excerpt. Um, so that's, that's probably plenty of examples for you all. Um, so now I think we can move into um, how to do this yourself. Um, so preparing for the interview. As with so many things, um, the planning, this is where most of the work is. So there's a lot to talk about here. When you're getting started, uh, you wanna start by figuring out what is your goal? What are you hoping to do? Um, and you'll talk it over with the person that you're hoping to interview. Um, do you want to record a general life history or do you wanna focus on their experiences in a particular time? Are you hoping mainly to record famous family lore or are you aiming to get a full and honest picture of their lives and relationships? You wanna be clear about um, what you're going to do with the interview once, it, once it's finished as well. Uh, which family members will you share it with and in what format, things like that. You wanna think through all of that. And if you're planning to publish the interview in any form, including posting it on the internet, um, you will need some sort of signed documentation of permission from the person being interviewed because these are their stories and they belong to them and they should be able to control um, what happens with them. Um, so those are things to think about. Um, and once you have some of that sorted out, before you do the interview, it's a good idea to do a little bit of research. Um, if you have any relevant uh, family history documents, those would be good to look over, uh, family photos or home movies, things like that. Um, and if you're gonna be asking your interviewee um, about their experience with a larger event, like for example, the civil rights movement, um, you might wanna do some reading to make sure you understand that context as well. So you can write some informed questions and be able to discuss that with them. Um, then you'll prepare an outline of topics to go over. Um, and again, share that with the person that you're gonna interview. Uh, you can write up a list of questions and certainly that's what I used to do when I would do interviews. Um, the sort of danger with that is that if you've written a list of questions and you give it to the person, sometimes you might get sort of stuck, sticking too closely to that, almost like it's a script. Whereas if you've got some topics generally that you wanna cover that can leave it, the sort of flow of conversation a little bit more open. Uh, the person who's being interviewed can sort of, that gives them to the space 
to um, share things that might not be on like a set list of questions. So that's sort of a, a personal preference, but something to think about um, there. Uh, and again, just you're talking all of this over <laughs> with the person that you're interviewing. Uh, you don't wanna just like walk up to grandma and stick a microphone in her face, right? You wanna make sure that she knows and understands um, and is totally on board with, with the project. Okay, how are you going to record? Um, this, there's a lot to, to talk about here and we are gonna get into the weeds a little bit, um, but big picture, you know, first you wanna figure out, do you want to do an audio recording or a video recording? And there are advantages and disadvantages to both. With video, um, as we saw with Sue Kunitomi's interview, obviously that adds a lot to the record. You have that added benefit of actually seeing them speaking. Um, on the other hand, digital video can be much harder to preserve in the long term than audio because there's so much more information and complexity that makes up that file. Um, the other thing to think about is that sometimes people um, can feel a little bit more shy when they have a video camera pointed at them. Um, whereas with an audio recorder, it could feel a little bit less obtrusive and they might be a little bit more comfortable. Um, so for those reasons, I have always preferred doing audio interviews, but you can absolutely do video and I will share some options for that. Um, then there's the question of whether you're going to do an in-person versus a remote interview. And this is obviously complicated by our current reality. Um, I'm gonna walk through options for both, starting with uh, options for recording in person, but I do recommend thinking very carefully about whether you feel it's safe to conduct an in-person interview with someone outside of your household, especially someone who might be older uh, during this pandemic, I guess personally, I would not recommend doing that. Um, so I would really say that the following might be best considered as guidance for post pandemic times, which will eventually come, <laughs> we will eventually be there. Okay, so for in-person interviews, um, if you're gonna do an audio interview, and particularly if you're planning to do like a bunch of interviews to interview a number of family members and if you really want high quality audio that will last for a long time if you're doing a big project like that you might think about investing in a digital audio recorder um, certainly this is the kind of equipment that um, you know, a library or a historical society or any sort of place like that, if they're doing an oral history project, they're probably using a digital audio recorder. Um, good ones can be a couple hundred dollars, so it's not a small investment, um, but that is an option that's open to you. Alternately, if you're not interested in that, uh, if you have a smartphone, uh, there are a lot of different apps that you can use, um, and that's really very easy. Um, if you have an iPhone, iPhones come with a voice memo app, so it's already on your phone. Um, if you have an Android phone like I do, um, you know, you can just search the app store for any sort of voice recorder. Easy voice recorder is one example. I downloaded it to my phone. It's just super easy um, and works really well. So. Um, those are those are options. You could also maybe record directly to a laptop, especially if you have an external microphone. Um, so lots of options there. For video, uh, smartphones or digital cameras can work pretty well. Um, if you're going to use a phone, you might want uh, like a little tripod or stand to sit it on so that you're not like holding your phone for an hour. Um, that probably would not be fun. Um, and just like with audio, if you have a decent laptop, uh, you can probably record video directly to it. Um, and again, you might, another thing to consider would be an external microphone just for better audio quality. 
Not required, um, but something like a little clip on mic that you can just have on someone's shirt um, can cost as little as $12 and it can really boost the quality of the audio. So those are things to think about for in-person interviews. Um, if you want to record an interview during the pandemic or if you're really at a distance from someone and it's hard to visit, um, you can definitely consider doing uh, a remote interview. For audio for a remote, for a remote interview, um, again, if you've got a smartphone, there are apps you can download. You'd be looking for a call recorder app. <clears throat> so there are a couple of examples there on the, on the slide. Tape a call was one that a lot of professionals recommended. It is not free, but I'm sure that there are free call recorder apps for iPhones. Um, and there's one for Android, Cube Call Recorder is just one example. Um, but you can do your own research and see if you wanna do that. For recording a remote video interview, you could use uh, good old Zoom, everybody's favorite. <laughs> uh, if you have a free account with Zoom, that allows you to have calls that are up to 40 minutes and you can record those as MP4 video files. Um, there's also FaceTime if you have a Mac or Skype, um, those are tools that you could use as well. Um, no matter what tools or software you end up using, you wanna make sure that you know where the microphones are and uh, test everything beforehand. If you're gonna be recording to your phone or a laptop, um, you also wanna make sure that there is sufficient storage for the file so that it won't run out of space while you're recording. Okay, so if at this point you're like, oh my gosh, that was so much, my head is spinning, what do I do? Uh, I get it. <laughs> so this is what I would recommend if, if you're in that camp. Um, if you're not interested in the technological details, First of all, I would say, if, it, if at all possible, wait until you feel it's safe to do an in-person recording. I think that's easier and will result in a, in a better quality experience. And I would say do an audio recording. Um, if you have a smartphone, use one of those audio recorder apps, um, like the voice memo for the iPhone or another voice recorder for, for your smartphone. If you do not have a smartphone, um, you might wanna think about just getting a cheap voice recorder. I know I mentioned the more expensive digital audio recorders, but you can also just get like a really cheap voice recorder from like Amazon or Target for something in the $30 range and that will absolutely work. So that's what I'd recommend. Um, but really, you just need to you know, think about your options and, and choose whatever seems easiest or best from your perspective. Um, and here I have a list of some other resources. Uh, if you want to learn more about tools and equipment for recording oral histories, a couple of those are from the Vermont Folklife Center um, for recording interviews remotely or in person. We've got one from UW-Milwaukee that's really great. And that last link there is for a site called Oral History in the Digital Age. Um, that's sort of geared towards professionals, um, but there's a ton of useful information there. So if you like really wanna get into it, I would definitely recommend checking that one out. Okay, so next, <laughs> next step, actually doing the interview. Um, so you wanna set a time and location uh, whether you're meeting in person or virtually, try to record in a place that doesn't have too much background noise. Um, in terms of timing, depending on your goals, you might allow like 90 minutes or so. Um, I would say that two hours is usually the maximum before energy really starts to flag for everyone. Um, and especially if you're recording somebody's life history and they're really, really getting into it, it's much better to record an interview in multiple sessions rather than trying to have like one marathon session. Um, 
anytime you're doing a recording like this, it's a good idea to start by saying your names, the date and location. So my name is Erin Dix. I'm here with Betty Cooper. It's October 14th, 2020. We're recording oral history interview in her home, something like that. Um, future historians will thank you if you do that. <laughs> it's always a good thing. Okay, so the, the interviewee, the person who's being interviewed is the star of the show. Your role is to ask questions and you're helping to guide that interview, but you really wanna try not to speak too much yourself or to interrupt. Um, you will be actively listening, which is really hard work, um, <laughs> but it's, it's worth it. So you'll, you'll ask open-ended questions to start and then listen to what they have to say. And you can sort of ask clarifying follow-up questions as needed. Um, but make sure that you allow some time to sit with pauses that might come up rather than jumping to fill those. And it's really important that the person being interviewed has the space to sort of reflect as memories are sort of being stirred up. So that's uh, important to remember. You might want to have some things like family photos or um, other documents available just because those can also help to to stir memories as as someone is thinking back and then lastly uh, just remember that the process can be emotional um, and that can be emotional for everyone um, and don't shy away I, I would recommend not shying away from topics that might be emotional um, or sensitive just be aware that um, those feelings can come up and it's, it's okay, um, just be sensitive to that. Okay, these are some example questions um, that I took from lots of different sources and I won't read all of these to you, uh, but notice that these are all open-ended questions. They're not leading questions. So you're not saying, for example, did you find it really hard to balance work and family? You're saying, how did you balance work and family? Um, and again, if you start with some sort of open questions like these, then you can follow up if you have, if you need particular details clarified or things like that. Um, so, the internet has lots and lots of resources for generating questions. And these are a few sources that I found um, that I really liked. Um, but yeah, you can use Google to help you with this. There are many, many uh, good lists of questions out there. Okay, moving on to sharing and preserving the recording. Um, so hooray, you finished the interview, that's good. Um, you might want to edit the interview if you have the, um, the inclination. There are some really good editing tools um, that are free. So if you've got an audio interview, something like Audacity is a software that's free for any platform, pretty easy to use. GarageBand comes with um, Mac computers, so that could be an option. Um, if you're using a smartphone app, some of those apps might be able to make basic editing changes like, um, like if you've got your audio file and you wanna clip out some sort of dead time at the beginning or the end and crop that out, you can do that. Or if you want to boost the levels, if it's pretty quiet, um, those are the kinds of things that you might think about doing. Uh, and the same goes for video editors. Most uh, computers these days come with some sort of built-in video editor for basic um, editing. So um, this is not required, uh, but you know, if you have the skills and the time and the inclination, you might think about just making some little changes to, to your files so that they're all ready to go. Um, and then sharing, uh, we are, living in a time when it's really easy to share digital files. 
And that's great. Uh, again, make sure that you have the interviewee's permission before uh, you go ahead and share that. And then just one note, uh, if you are thinking that you might want to donate that recording to a library or archive, um, they will want probably a signed release form that will clarify uh, permission for research use. Um, so just keep that in mind. If you're just doing this for your own family use, you don't need to worry about that. Okay, preserving. Um, preserving digital files is a topic that could be its own presentation, um, but I'll keep it quick here. The short story is that it can actually be harder to preserve digital files than it is to preserve their analog equivalent. Um, a good rule of thumb is called the 321 rule. And that means three copies that are stored on two different media with one of those being offsite. So for example, that might mean one copy on your computer's hard drive, another copy on a family member's hard drive, and a third copy in cloud storage like Google Drive. So not too hard. Um, and then also every five years or so, you'll want to uh, check on your files and migrate them to newer formats as needed. Um, if this is something that is stressing you out again, <laughs> um, if you don't really want to think about this, and if you have extra time, uh, you might want to type out a written transcript of the interview um, that, that can be time consuming to do, but then you have an additional backup. You can print that out and have a piece of paper or, you know, sheets of paper that you can put in a folder and it, it's not subject to the same sorts of concerns about obsolescence. So it's sort of an extra layer of security if you want to do that. Okay. So just a couple of, of final thoughts here before we get to some time for questions, if there are any. Um, so don't let the perfect be the enemy of the good. Um, good advice always. Um, what I've shared here are some good rules of thumb and best practices. But if you are feeling sort of intimidated by this uh, or any of this, you should not let it stop you from giving it a try. Um, again, as far as the equipment goes, use whatever tools seem easiest and most natural for you. Just sitting down with your loved one um, and a recording device for an hour or calling them up with FaceTime or Skype, or again, even just having a conversation with no recording, any of those things will certainly be worth it and you'll be glad that you did it. And then lastly, this is a, a quote from a fairly recent story in Atlas Obscura about uh, oral, oral history for families by Jessica Hester. I just really liked this. So she said, an oral history isn't about extracting a story. It's about strengthening bonds and appreciating people who take the time to share their view of the world. Um, I just really like how that emphasizes that oral history is about connection, uh, which is something that we could all use more of. <laughs> okay, so that is the end of my sort of prepared remarks here. Um, and at this point, if there are any questions that folks have raised in the chat, I would be happy to try and answer those. <laughs> Hey, Aaron, um, right now, no questions have come in yet, but um, we'll wait just a minute because there's a little bit of a delay um, between YouTube and Zoom. Uh, but I want to point out to everybody that if you log off and have questions later, Erin works at Waukesha Public Library. So you can always contact her here, and I'm sure she would be happy to answer your questions at a later time. Yes, I would. Thank you. <laughs> Oh. Very true. And this, so this presentation or this recording will be in YouTube, right, Corey and Sarah? 
Yeah. So if you, you could come back to this later. I know I shared a lot of different links to things. So this will be something you can come back to later if you feel so inclined. Yes, this will live on youtube.com slash Waukesha Reads. So you can go back there and look up any anything that you want to see again. Anything come in? Okay, I guess we don't have any questions because Aaron did such a complete presentation. Thank you, Aaron, um, for doing that presentation for us. It was great. And um, thanks for being part of Waukesha Reads. Yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in and thank you both Amy, or sorry, Sarah and Corey. <laughs> of course. All right, good night everybody.